and we thought it was amazing. It was an amazing organization. It was a really great uh, experience for us. We immediately went out and applied for membership because you have to apply, and um, and we got in, which was a really which was a really big deal for us. And since that time, uh, I think pretty much everyone who's in this room has heard from me on this topic, and and heard from Corinne. And uh, we are going to be uh, going to a regional uh, uh, hub event this year. And I think for, for UVM, where we have not um, had a ton of experience in this area and where we're really pushing it out, this is a critical, uh, critical um, affiliation for us, a critical ally, a great organization. Um, so uh, Tony has led UIDP, a solutions-oriented membership organization comprised of top-tier innovation companies and world-class research universities. UIDP supports mutually benefited collaborations by developing and disseminating strategies for addressing common issues between the sectors, academic, corporate, and government. Its activities help members achieve meaningful impact on a broad array of collaboration matters, ranging from contracting to commercialization and workforce development. After completing his doctorate in inorganic chemistry, Tony embarked on a career spanning more than 30 years with a focus on research and innovation. He managed a variety of administrative, programmatic, and strategic initiatives for academic, government, and private sector organizations, including the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and PricewaterhouseCoopers. More recently, Tony was part of a team selected to create and manage the Engineering Research Visioning Alliance, IRVA, uh, and at irvacommunity.org, an NSF-funded initiative with a mission to identify and develop new engineering research directions and catalyze high-impact research that benefits society. Uh, I met Tony for the first time online at an NSF workshop that, that uh, Suresh uh, Garamella, our President Garamella, smuggled me into last summer. I know there's kind of a pattern there uh, now that I think about it, but um, but uh, and at that at that uh, meeting, we talked with a large group of folks, and it was a workshop on on partly on the future of NSF and partly on the future of wh what we're what they're calling use inspired research. That actually came to a fore just recently when NSF announced the new TIP directorate, um, uh, which is a, a use inspired translation innovation partnership directorate that's really aimed at just the kind of work you're seeing today. And, and Tony's organization was right at the center of it. He's, uh, he's been at it a long time, but now is the moment, and that makes it look like really good timing. So, you know, and, uh, that was really a thrill. And I think this is something that we uh, at the university have a lot to learn from and a lot to contribute to. So we're really excited about this. And uh, so on that prospect of that, we reached out and asked Tony if he was willing to come up here on a beautiful spring afternoon of light snow uh, in Vermont, stay at the Two Seasons Hotel and uh, and join us for the conference. So uh, I'm really thrilled. It's a great pleasure. We had a nice morning talking together. Tony. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. All right. So. Uh, I have my clock timer on, so I, I will not run long. And, and I want to certainly leave a lot of time for, for questions and discussion, because I, I always learn when I come to campuses. And so it's uh, one of the best parts of my job is I get to visit company sites and university sites, uh, government agencies, and, and talk about something I'm really passionate about, which is how we collaborate to solve societal problems. And so right now, as Kirk mentioned, there's just such a focus on how we can work collaboratively to solve big issues and big challenges. It's not just all about making money, uh, but certainly making money is part of it because if you don't make money, it's hard to do things in today's world. So uh, I'd like to just, before I, I get too far into my talk, I, I do want to thank uh, Suresh. Uh, I've known Suresh a long time for inviting me to come to your beautiful campus and your city. This is the first time I've been in Vermont. Uh, I would have liked a little bit warmer weather, but uh, I stayed at the Hotel Vermont last night and it was great. There's a wonderful little hotel here. Uh, I got this nice little booklet in the hotel room, you know, so uh, I didn't steal anything from the, no towels or anything, but I did take this. Uh, and so I want to thank Suresh, I want to thank Kirk and, and Corinne for inviting me to be here today and to just talk with you, thank you so much, just talk with you about this topic around how we collaborate to once again really improve the human condition. Okay, so I'm going to try to say a couple of things today. Uh, these are my personal observations and reflections. I would like to say they don't reflect those of the 
the organization because I don't want to get fired over something I say, but uh, I do want to leave you some things that maybe will stir some thought and then, like I said, maybe learn a little bit from, from you all because every community, every university has something, uh, has unique assets that they bring to the table. And so, you know, I, coming into this facility is really amazing. You, you should be very proud of this. Uh, there are many, many communities that would die to have something like this facility with a view of the lake. And, and that brings together and allows you to have engineered serendipity, right? So the energy and the buzz that's in here, even I'm sure not when, not when the conference is here, but just people walking around. I, I, I walk down to the far end to use the restroom and I walk by and there are people gathering and talking in, in a variety of ways, which I think probably leads me to my first point, which is, you know, we talk about collaborations between companies and universities and government agencies, increasingly nonprofits. It's not organizations that collaborate. It's people that collaborate, right? So the worst thing that ever happened to collaborations, in my opinion, was email. So uh, email is a great efficiency tool for working collaboratively, but if you don't know people and you don't know something about them, uh, it makes it harder. So, you know, you can send an email uh, to, to your spouse or to your child or to a friend. If, you know, they're calling you and you're in a meeting, you can send a note back that says, busy, can't talk. And your spouse understands that, right? They know, hey, they're in a meeting, there's something going on. If you send a message to somebody you never met and said something along those lines, they could take it one of two ways. They could take it as, well, you know, they're busy or what a jerk, right? And because there's no nuancing. So one of the things that I hope we're, we're going to get to, and today's a great example of this, is getting back together and, and meeting in person. And, and collaborations are predicated on not just professional relationships, but personal trust. And so you know, one of the things I hope you all will invest in and think about is how you can get people to visit this great city, visit this great facility, which is a great attractant, uh, eat some wonderful food here in town, and then also go out and talk to people, uh, which I think is really, really important. So, you know, email's a great thing, but it's not uh, the end-all, be-all. Zoom is okay, but it, it doesn't, um, it, it's not the solution to things. And I think most of you, how many people here are saying to yourself, man, I want to stay on Zoom forever? Anybody? No? Okay. All right. Great. All right. So now, let's talk about the university, the innovation ecosystem, and, and what's going on not just in the United States, but globally. There is an incredible sense of urgency to solve problems in today's world. And that means that you're competing against every university, not just in the United States, not just in North America, but globally, in competing to get the attention of funders, collaborators, and people who can execute. So, how do you instill that sense of urgency that allows you to do some of the things that we heard about today, which are start companies, make products to help people, right? So I just want to point out this, this sense of urgency is incredibly important. And uh, it doesn't mean chaotic movement, but thoughtful, structured pace is really important to what you're going to do if you want to be successful. You are competing on a global scale to collaborate with others and win people's attention. And, and so I, I don't know how to tell you specifically to what would work here at University of Vermont or in the Burlington ecosystem, but I will just tell you having a sense of urgency is incredibly important. As it relates to engagement, uh, we need to think about innovation ecosystems, and we also need to think about a mosaic of engagement. It's not just licensing, it's not just sponsored research, it's not just hiring of students, but there are a whole list of things that you can do to collaborate with different groups. And one of the challenges that I think universities have when they go to talk to external parties about collaboration is they have a tendency to talk, want to talk about what their interest and passion is or are, right? So, at the university, you know, I, Kirk gave me a walking tour today and I got to walk through some of the campus. I heard about some of the great research that you all got patents for, congratulations. 
And I think there's a tendency when you wanna meet with somebody from the outside, you wanna tell them what you're great at, right? You know, we're great at this. We're, we have a really good department doing this or a really good department doing that. And I would argue that you're much better off starting a conversation with somebody that you wanna collaborate with, asking them what their needs are. And it's antithetical, I think, for especially faculty who are the world's experts in the niche that they operate in, right? So in this room, how many people are faculty members here, right? right? Okay, so you're probably, if you're not the world's expert, you're one of the leaders in that space that you play in. And, and so you wanna talk about that and share that with people. But when you're talking to external parties, they really wanna tell you about what their pinch points are, what their needs are, and then maybe there's a way that you can help them solve that problem. And so I'll use this analogy. My, my wife tells me I'm not very funny, so I'm, this isn't a joke. I'll just use this analogy because I think it works. You know, I have three kids. And when the kids were little, we had a minivan. And for those of you who think you'll never own a minivan, wait till you have kids. You'll, you'll get a minivan, right? So, all right, so that's good. I got I to laugh there. That's fine. Um, so when, when we had three little kids and we needed a minivan, we went to the car dealership. And, and if the car dealership salesperson had said, you know, we have a minivan, but the best car in our lot is a two-door, would we have cared? No, right? We needed a minivan. So if you're talking to a company about partnering with the University of Vermont or working with your startup or whatever the case may be, I would argue it is much better to start the conversation by asking the company representative, what are your needs and is there a way that the university can help you solve that problem? Okay? And it's amazing to me how many people don't do that. So I guess that's one of my pieces of sage advice for y'all is to do a lot more listening and a lot less talking. All right, so back to this idea of there's lots of ways to engage. Once again, it's not just licensing. In fact, licensing is an incredibly small piece of engagement. Uh, sponsored research is, is certainly a big way, but for companies, they tend to think about talent. For most companies that you're partnering with or have a great relationship with. It's really about accessing talent, not just students, but increasingly faculty. And so, you know, things like co-location, things like uh, accessing facilities, you know, you're, we, we, you were showing me some of your facilities buildings that you're, you're investing in here. Things like providing capstone project opportunities or micro internships or whatever the case may be. Those all figure into how you build a relationship. So, you know, for faculty or students, you're, you're in the trenches, you know, you're, you're doing what you do, but people like Kirk and people like Suresh, they need to think more globally about engagement, right? So, uh, like I said, I like telling anecdotes. I was at John Deere in Moline, Illinois, at the John Deere Museum. If you've never been there, it's a pretty cool place. If you, if you like big toys, right, big tractors and stuff. And so I was there with John Hickman, who was the global academic uh, relations manager for John Deere. Somebody from a university in the Midwest went up to John and said, you know, John, we're like right down the street from you and we're not doing a lot with John Deere. You're not investing a lot of money at our university. And John, without even skipping a beat, said, I just signed off on an invoice for X dollars for tuition for our employees to take classes at your institution. So we're investing, it's just, it's not in the research area, we're investing in this other area, which was important to Deere. So I think it's really important when you think about collaborations that you have an understanding of the totality of how you're engaging with outside parties. All right, so uh, I wanna talk about, a little bit more about research and commercialization now that's kind of the focus of this event. So I, I wanna talk about what does it mean to be an industry engaged university? This is a, a term that we use a lot at UIDP uh, I've been working with a colleague of mine, Randy Hall, who's the former senior research officer at Southern Cal, around what does it mean to be an industry-engaged university? And so, you know, I, I'm gonna be 60 this year. Uh, I used to be a, a little heavier. Uh, my wife would say a lot heavier. And in 2007, I decided I wanted to lose weight. So I started going to the gym. And I started at the local Y, and I didn't really know what I was doing. But I changed a little bit of my diet and I started working out and I lost weight, right? Now, 
I'd like to lose a little bit more, but I would have to give up carbs. And I'm not willing to give up carbs. So I have to be happy at the weight I'm at. Now, if you say you want to be an industry-engaged university, then there are things that you're going to have to do that make it so. Just saying it means nothing. It's what are you prepared to do, right? It's like that scene from uh, the movie with Kevin Costner and Sean uh, Connery uh, about Al Capone. What was that movie called? What was that? The Untouchables. The Untouchables, right? So uh, in, that, in that movie, there's a scene where a police officer had been killed. Kevin Costner uh, is Elliot Ness, and he says, we need to get Al Capone. And, and Sean Connery, who's a, a, an Irish policeman from Chicago, says, well, great, what are you prepared to do? And he says, I'm prepared to do anything within the law. And he goes, no, no, no. What are you really prepared to do to get Capone? So if you want to be an industry-engaged university, and I'm not here to say you should be, but if you want to be an industry-engaged university and win against other universities, right, what are you prepared to do? So let me give you some specific things to think about. Uh, in your strategic plan, do you talk about partnering with external groups to solve societal problems? Do your promotion and tenure criteria give credit to faculty for partnering with industry? So industry-sponsored research awards, do they get credit similar to a DOE or an NSF or an R01, right? There's a whole movement now called PTI, PTI right? Have you all heard, anybody heard of PTI? There you go, there's somebody in the back. You can look it up, it's ptie.org. Universities are adopting PTI as a way to recognize innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, would you let a company rent space in a university-owned building? Right? It, it sounds great, but there are a lot of things behind that. And attorneys get involved, oh, we can't do that. There's always, you know, there's always people who can tell you no. Who are the people that can tell you yes to make this happen, right? So are you willing to rent space on your campus? Are you willing to let faculty be jointly employed by a company and the university at the same time long term? So uh, I'll give you a very specific example. There are not enough data scientists in the world. Any data scientists in here? Any data scientists? All right, a couple, right? So there's just not enough of them. So at the University of Washington, they had this problem. Companies were hiring all their data scientists. University of Washington Computer Science Department is a really good department. Um, but the companies were really ticking off the University of Washington. And the companies realized, well, if we hire all the faculty, who's going to teach the next set of data scientists, right? So the chairman of that computer science department got together with a couple of companies and said, look, we've, we've got we've to find a better way to make this work. So what did they do? They came up with a, an approach that allowed a person to be on the tenure track, receive tenure, apply for NSF funding or DOD funding, and yet work at the company 49% of the time, where they do proprietary research for the company, they make their own salary, which was very substantial for 49% of the time, had their own research group. At most universities, if you propose that, it'd be like, but faculty Senate would say, no, we can't, you can't do that, right? You, that's not allowed by the faculty handbook. How can you do that? Um, so these are the kinds of things, these are attributes that make an industry-engaged university. And, and there are a lot more. Uh, call me at any time. I'll be pleased to chat with you more about it. I, I want to limit my time here because, you know, I only want to leave time for Q&A at the end. But there's a lot to being an industry-engaged university. And, and Randy Hall, my my colleague and collaborator has written a, a paper with me and, and a student on how strategic plans at universities correlate to what it means to be an industry engaged university. Okay, So I wanted to, to talk about that. I'm going to move on to another subject now, which is competing globally to win big awards. All right. So uh, we talk about university industry collaborations. Increasingly, there is interest in the federal government and in the nonprofit profit sector to support universities to solve societal problems. The best example of that that we can look at is what happened with COVID, right? So uh, 
you can, you know, you can go and read all the articles about Oxford and AstraZeneca and what happened. It was messy, right? But people were what? Dying. You don't worry about royalty rates when literally thousands of people a day are dying, right? So uh, there's urgency around all these big topic issues, clean water, climate change, uh, other viruses, right? Access to rare earth materials. What would happen if several countries cut off the spigot to our access to rare earth minerals? Have you all ever thought about that? You should. It's a problem. So what would we do, right? Um, there's a scene in Apollo 13. We talked about this last night at dinner, right? It's, uh, it's, one, of, it's one of my favorite movies. Uh, the, the capsule has the fire inside, if you all remember, and they shut everything down, and they're running out of oxygen. So they go into a conference room. There's a table like this size. There's a bunch of you know, geeky white guys like my dad, who worked, by the way, on the, on the Apollo Saturn V rocket. Short sleeve white shirts, open collar, the sh pocket protectors, right? And they throw a bunch of crap on a table in the conference room. And they go, this is what they've got. We've got to make an oxygen generator in the next 24 hours out of this stuff, or guess what? They're going to die. So you're not worried about, oh, well, am I going to get paid overtime for being here today? Um, you know, is my parking pass going to expire? Am I going to be able to get out of the parking lot? No. What are you worried about? You're worried about die, people not dying on Apollo 13. So there are these big challenges, and government, the nonprofit sector, academics, companies both large and small are thinking about how do we tackle these big challenges, right? And so this is really a unique place and time. Uh, I've, I've been in this game a long time. I, I got my PhD in 88. I went to Washington as a science policy fellow, I, and I got to work at a couple of federal agencies. In 1988, if you had said that the National Science Foundation would be setting up a technology and innovation partnerships directorate, you would have been laughed out of the building, right? So my peers in the room would know, right? I mean, that was just not, I mean, there was a lot of pushback on the science and technology centers let alone ERCs and all these other things. So we're seeing this goal of solving big societal problems through collaborations. So there are venture philanthropist groups out there. There are groups like Schmidt Futures. They just did a big report on the bioeconomy. You should look at it if you're interested in that. And so the question is, how does the University of Vermont get to play as part of the groups trying to solve these big problems, right? So that goes to how you present yourselves to people outside the university. It goes to working at pace and solving problems, right? So how can you under-promise and over-deliver to people that you want to partner with to make you a trusted relationship? And, and that's a question you all have to ask yourself. You know, I've been in, Bur in, been in Burlington. I've been in Vermont for less than 24 hours. So, I don't know about the DNA here. I mean, I know some of your folks. Uh, I know a little bit just from looking at your website. Uh, but you all have to decide collectively, do you want to play on a global scale at solving societal problems? And if you do, then what do you need to do? What's your YMCA moment? What is it for you that you need to do to make yourself successful in being part of those solutions? Now, let me tell you what part of the problem that you face. Other universities aren't sitting around and saying, you know what, we have a great relationship with this company. We'll pull back so the University of Vermont can take our place. Right? So there is a trend where companies, instead of doing 100 projects with 100 universities, are doing 20 projects at five. So how do you become a trusted partner to a small number of uh, companies or other groups to help them solve big problems. And, and I think that's really the opportunity for you. So it's 2022. If I were to come back in 2027, you know, would you have moved the needle in terms of forming strategic collaborations with a certain number of companies? Right? Maybe that's a goal for you. Maybe it's not. But that's something to consider if you want to be moving forward as an industry-engaged university. All right. Uh, I want to talk 
a little bit about where you are today based on your data. So, you know, I, I had a chance to look at your, your NSF R&D expenditure data. Uh, just in terms of calibration point, the industry funding at universities in terms of R&D expenditures has been around five to six to six and a half percent since 1970. It's a pretty flat amount. So the pie gets bigger, but the piece from industry going to universities is about the same. You all are below that. So I think a simple aspirational goal for you all is to try to reach the national average. So can you get to 5% of your funding from industry as a percent of your R&D expenditures? I think that's something, uh, I didn't say that to Kurt before, but I think that's something that clearly is, is an aspirational goal that you can move toward, and it's not gonna happen overnight, but it's a realistic goal. And it's something that's achievable if you in the audience, the, the, the pilots of the university, who are the pilots of the university? The faculty, right? So if the pilots of the university want to do more with the private sector, you can. It's up to you if you want to do that. Now, uh, y'all are a friendly audience, somewhat self-selected because you, you all decided to come to this event. Um, I visit a lot of campuses, and there's usually somebody in the back of the room who's got their arms crossed, who's just waiting for me to finish. And he's loaded for, it's usually a, you know, some, a guy, and he's usually loaded for bear, right? And so I get done and I say, any questions? First hand up. And they'll, he'll say, my name is blank, and I'm from physics or chemistry. I've been at the university 30 years, and I've had NSF funding continuous for the last 30 years. Why the hell should I work with industry? And, and my answer is always the same, don't. You know, it, it, if you're happy with your NSF standard award or your R01, fine, just, just do that. But, and I'm, this is more, I would say, for some of the more junior faculty to think about. And this is a change. If you want to win big awards, whether it's from the federal government or from nonprofits or from anywhere, you're gonna to have to have a plan to partner with the private sector to create products that improve the human condition. So you cannot win a $5 million a year award from any federal agency today that doesn't have something around translation that leads to societal benefit. That is just, it, those do not exist. And so if you're a faculty member and you're a leader in your discipline, and you are looking to help find solutions to societal problems, the only way that's gonna happen is if you partner with somebody outside the university who can make what you're doing into a product or an, you know, an algorithm or something that improves people's lives and therefore also make money. So, if you're one of the angry faculty members that I see on other campuses with their arms crossed and you don't want to work with industry, don't. But uh, it will help you if you're interested in winning big awards and solving big challenges. The other piece which I'll point out for the other maybe group of you all who are, who are faculty members, you may not think of yourself as this, but you're a small business owner, right? So you have to generate $850,000 a year to pay for your equipment, your two postdocs, your three grad students, and an undergrad. If you can get $100,000 a year from a company on a recurring basis, that's 12% of your budget, right? And that's a good thing. Now, it's harder to get to getting the $100,000 a year recurring, but I bet you if you went to the Office of Sponsored Research here, you'll find there are faculty members that every year submit a one-page task order, basically, and they get $80,000 or $90,000 or $100,000 from some company that they've been getting money for from the past eight or 10 years. That's a good position to be in, all right? So I've given you some reasons, I think, to think about partnerships. Uh, I think the university, you know, you're, a, you're the big dog in the state. I've worked at universities in states where, uh, I worked in Ohio, and the president at Ohio State at the time, Gordon Gee, he wouldn't say this, but it was basically, you know, Snow White and the 12 Dwarfs, right? 
There, there were lots of PhD granting institutions. It hurt Ohio State in terms of being able to build a research enterprise um, because the money was kind of spread out across the state. There was 28 biological PhD programs in the state of Ohio in 1995. Just think about that. So it's y'all, right? The University of Vermont, you're it, you're the big dog. How do you take advantage of that to work on things that matter to the people of this state, the people of this country, and the people of the world? So I think there's a lot of opportunities for you all. I'll be pleased to come back at another point and, and talk with you more in depth. Uh, on the startup front, candidly, for this, I, when I saw the title after Suresh invited me, I said, you know, you really should have invited my wife, Laura, who's a, who has a startup company, because uh, she'd be a lot more relevant in some ways to you all who are inventors. Um, but honored to be here. Uh, I want to leave time for q and I'm going to leave, though, with a closing comment. How many people in here are students? How many students are there? All right. Some of y'all are trolling me on LinkedIn, by the way, but that's okay. Uh, I'll connect if y'all want to connect. Um, all right. So this is a closing comment for you all. Uh, if you don't remember anything else I said, there are students in this world that are smarter than you. That's just the reality. Not only are they smarter, but they're willing to work harder than you. And the third one is they're willing to do it for less money. So how do you make yourself relevant in terms of being employable after you get out of school? So that's just something to think about. Um, you know, it's a different workplace today than it was 20, even 10 years ago. But uh, I just think it's really important if you're a student to think about your career pathway and what you're prepared to do to be employable, take care of yourself, but then also have an impact on the world. Because I know many of you all want to have impact, right? How many, if I asked the students in here, how many of you do not care about the impact on the world? None of you would say that, right? You all want to have some positive impact. So think about that, okay? Because you all have a, an important role to play. This generation of students is smarter than the last generation, which was smarter than the generation before. Um, but it's an incredibly global world, and companies have the opportunity to partner with anybody in the world. Most companies have research groups in India, China, Germany, the UK, the United States, Canada, and Brazil, or Australia. So you're competing against them. So that's just something to think about. All right, so on that happy note, um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to end by telling you one little anecdote, and then I'm going to open up the q and A. I'm not wearing a tie today. So I used to wear a tie all the time. I was like Kirk. I used to wear ties. And I went to an NSF-supported i meeting when i started at Stanford. And if you haven't been to Stanford's campus, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful campus. So we're, I was under this big white tent uh, on right off Page Mill Road, famous Page Mill Road. And I'm sitting next to this guy. He's a young guy. And he's not wearing a tie. And I, I said to him, I said, you know, I introduced myself. I'm Tony Bocanfuso. Uh, I said, what do you do? And he goes, well, my name is so-and-so, and, -so and I'm, a, I'm a VC. And I said, you know, I noticed you guys don't wear ties. What, what's the deal with that? And he said, Tony, I wear a tie when I ask people for money. So you all are lucky because I'm not wearing a tie today, because that's my, that's my rule. So if you see me wearing a tie, you need to run, because I'm usually that means I'm going to ask you for money. OK, all right, thank you so much for listening to my talk today, and I look forward to answering any questions you all might have. All right, any questions? Yes. Hi, Tony. Thanks for this opportunity. Sure, and what's your name? I'm Carly. Hey, Carly. I'm an MBA student at UVM. And I was curious, I know you talk a lot about you know, working with Boston partnerships with corporations for funding. I was curious, kind of to your last anecdote, if you could speak to where you see room for building partnerships or relationships with funders, such as VCs, angel investors, or banks, um, to help support inventors and entrepreneurs within the yeah, so you talked about venture capitalists or angel investors. And, and you know, once again, I'm not familiar with the innovation ecosystem here in Vermont. Most communities have an angel network or have a state or a local. You know, it's amazing how many cities and counties actually have, you know, a, a nonprofit entity that's funded with local government or, like, tax credits. So I'm in South Carolina. The way we do it is there's something called the South Carolina Research Authority. 
they don't get money from the legislature because that would be politically hard in our state to do. But what they do is they have tax credits that they can sell. And that's the way they raise money. And then they run a fund, right? Um, look, I, I think it goes back to the whole point about listening. So if you're trying to raise money, I think a lot of, a lot of it requires you to do research on what people are interested in, right? Uh, I, will, I will tell you, I hear from a lot of funders that people come unprepared to talk to them. They don't invest the time and energy to do the research required to meet, make for a meaningful meeting. So basically, you get one bite at the apple. So you know, if you reach out on LinkedIn to somebody in you know, Atlanta uh, who's got a fund and you think they might be interested in what you're doing, uh, spend time. You know, don't say, hey, can we talk tomorrow? Because what you're showing them is, well, you don't really, you know, you're, you don't, you're not going to do the, the work. So I think whoever the funder is, spending time doing the research on what their priorities are and what they're looking to invest in is really important. And candidly, most people don't do the work needed, which is, which is unfortunate, because you basically you get one bite at the apple. I mean, you, if you get more than one, that's, that's really a, a blessing. Thanks. Yes, sir. Mr. Inventor, you, you, why don't you come up here? You can answer the question. Uh, hey, okay. I'm going to take you up on something you said. Sure. Uh, my name is Dan Weiss, and I'm sitting here with Africa Arms. There you go. And you've been funded 30 years by NIH. I've been uh, here for 20 years. I've been funded forever by NIH and the European Foundation. And I love industry work. Mm -hmm. That's great. So let me make a point that I didn't make during my talk, but that you, you kind of jumped my thought process to, to bring this up. In the UIDP, we have around 70 plus companies. And they're, they're Fortune 100 companies, you know, the ones Apple, Microsoft, Pfizer, Boeing, the, the companies you all know. Never in, in my lifetime has there been as much interest in the companies that have open innovation groups to work with universities to get government money to match their funding. So this is, a, this is a common challenge that we think about. We think about companies, first of all, being homogenous or they're all the same. They're not. So you, know, you look at a big company, you pick the company. Now, just Acme. Acme might have four business units, right? Each business unit has their own P&L and has their own chief executive. Sometimes the head of this fourth business unit was acquired and actually doesn't like the other three business units. He thinks or she thinks they're jerks or idiots, right? And, and so all they care about is their own P&L because their bonus structure is predicated on that unit. Then there's an overhead function, right? And that's where corporate research sits and tech scouts. The tech scouts are the people that you engage at the university. Because someone in the, one of those four business units says, we need a solution to this problem. You tech scouts in the overhead group, go find it. And then they reach out, and they find you. And what they're increasingly trying to do is figure out, OK, if we make a $250,000 a year investment at the University of Vermont, can Dan get $250,000 from Ditra or you know, whomever? Office of Science or whomever to match what we're doing so that I can go back inside and say the $250,000 that we invested at the University of Vermont is actually a half a million dollars because Dan got funding from the Department of Energy or, or DOD or whomever. So what you're seeing, and how many computer scientists are in here? Any, any computer scientists? OK. So in the size directorate at NSF, there has been an increasing number of joint solicitations where a company like Amazon puts up $5 million. 
NSF puts up $5 million, it's a $10 million pot. They make 10 awards. Five actually come from Amazon, five come from NSF. What faculty members like about that is they like the NSF review process, right? And Amazon likes it because they don't have to use, you know, they, they trust the NSF review process too. And they actually determine which ones they're gonna fund. So they're not necessarily mixing paint, if that makes sense. So that whole issue of partnering with faculty members to access whether it's state funds. So there are states like Maryland, California traditionally have had industry match programs. Do you have an SBIR match program in the state? Any S yeah, so, all right, so most of what I've talked about are large companies, but there are states that match SBIR funds, right? So these are all things where companies get to leverage support from other funders to support academic research, and I think that's a great, great opportunity. So thanks, Dan. Yes, sir. Yeah. They don't have an incentive to go out of the state. I mean, there's kind of a soil problem of making the right environment to do exactly what you're suggesting. Yeah. So the question is, how can the, the university be more successful in getting companies to locate here? And, and uh, I don't know enough. I, I'm going to be, you know, I'm, I don't know enough about the university to give you an answer to that. What I, what I can tell you is that there are other areas that are a heck of a lot more uh, remote than Burlington that have been incredibly successful in, in recruiting companies. And a lot of it is based on talent exchange. Not just students, once again, but faculty, postdocs, et cetera. And so, uh, I mean, this is, this is like peeling an onion. There are lots of multinational companies that have a 50 state strategy because they have a political business model. Not Republican, Democrat, but you know what I mean? They, they're tied to the government. So if you look at some of the defense contractors, right? They have representation in every state. Why is that? Because when the bill is up to fund new fighter planes or tanks, they, want, they, they have their people go to every state senator, well, senator from every state, right, and say, Hey, do you know that we have 433 jobs in the state of Vermont? Um, so there's that issue. Uh, but I do think it's a talent. You know, part of it is, an, is a talent issue. How do you retain talent here? So, you know, I understand the university has a lot of people who come from out of the state to come to school here. Um, how do you retain people to stay post-graduation? I don't think we're at an equilibrium point right now post-COVID. I think I'm not, you know, the whole remote work, the issue, I, 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 you know, you can go on the internet and you can search and you get a thousand different experts telling you that we're gonna go fully remote, to, we're gonna be fully back in the office and then everything in between. So uh, if I had an answer for that, I'd probably join McKinsey and I'd make a lot more money than I'm making now. Um, but what I would say is there are gonna be opportunities for places like the university, like this community. You have a lot of natural assets here. Right? You all are here because part of it is the quality of life, right? There's a, a quality of life issue. So I live in South Carolina. Charleston has an, a, a pretty big digital corridor. Why? Have you all ever been to Charleston? It is one of the world's great cities, right? And, and so, you know, someone like my daughter who's an RN, she is never going to leave Charleston. Kicking and screaming, she would have, you know, right? Um, so, there are things about Burlington and this area that, that would attract people. Um, is that sufficient in of itself to attract companies or keep talent here? I think that's a bigger challenging question that I, unfortunately I don't have the answer to, but I do think it's a lot about talent um, and, and being able to support companies. So um, in, in our town, I live in Columbia, which is not Charleston, by the way, unfortunately, but um, I do love Columbia. Um, we had the first Intel facility east of the Mississippi. And you ask yourself, well, why Columbia, South Carolina? Well, they did an acquisition. There were 300 people there. 
They bought the company partly because they wanted that talent, right? They told them, okay, y'all are gonna have to move to Portland. And 270 of them said, mm, we ain't moving. <laughs> and so, so Intel had a choice, right? They, they could take the assets and leave and then take 25 people, or they could have the first Intel facility east of the Mississippi. And that's what they did. It had nothing to do with the economic developers and the tax incentives from the state. It was, right? People like living there. So I do think if you can retain talent here and you have to create an environment that retains talent, and, and it's hard. I mean, it's hard because you're competing, right? There are a lot of pulls from places. Kirk. Mm -hmm. Right, and so I, you know, we know the big names that have come out in this partnership space. Is there even something in here? What are the universities that are doing something different that you see on the radar that allows them to do what they do? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> you always have to be careful in doing that. So, and I'll, and I'll use, you know, I'll use the MIT ILP program, right? So, in my world, the gold standard for in industry liaison programs is MIT's. It's been around a long time. Companies pay six figures a year just to have access to talk to faculty. I've had great universities, great universities, ask me, well, we want to create what MIT IOP has. And I say, don't try because you're going to fail. It's, that is a set of one. You know, there aren't many universities that can set up a, an industry liaison program and charge six figures just to talk to faculty. Okay, that's a cultural thing that works at MIT. There are though places that are, if you talk to companies and you say, who are your strategic partners? There are commonalities that you hear, right? And, and who are they? And it varies by field a little bit, right? But you, know, you hear places like Georgia Tech, Purdue, Illinois, uh, you, you hear Stanford, you obviously hear MIT. Uh, and then, you know, in other fields, you'll hear Texas come up, right? Uh, UCSD will come up, UCSB will come up. I mean, you know, California's a country, right? So, um, so I, you know, I think those are, those are quite, and you ask yourself, well, like, how did Georgia Tech do what they've done over the last 25 years? Now, part of it is they're in Atlanta, and if they did nothing right, right, Atlanta, has just grown. So is that fair? To, is that a good comparison for you all? Probably not. But asking yourself, how does Illinois, which, by the way, if you've been, anybody from Urbana-Champaign, anybody? Been, okay, I went, I've only been there once. I went there in January. Don't ever go to Urbana-Champaign in January. It is, it's a beautiful place, but it is rough there. You know, it's a rough winter. And it's far from, what is it, two and a half hours to Chicago, Urbana-Champaign, something like that, by car? I mean, it's not, you know, it's not a thriving metropolis. And yet companies love working with Illinois. And it's because they produce really exceptional students, they have great researchers, and they have an industry-facing approach to partnering with companies, both large and small. And so, you know, are there things that you can learn from Illinois? Probably, you know, you, your president came from Purdue. Once again, West Lafayette is not, you know, it's not a big city, it's not, you know, a thriving metropolis. I mean, it's a nice town. You came from Lincoln, right? There are some good things about Lincoln. So I do think there are things you can learn, but I also think people sometimes get caught up in this idea that, well, if it works at Purdue, it can work at Vermont. And that's not always the case. Uh, I would focus on what can you control? And what you control or what you can impact is having incentives and reward structures that align with your values, right? So the president, the provost, the deans, the VPR, the chief research officer, the dean of the medical school, you, you all have the ability to put to practice the people who report to you and ensure that they operationalize the values that you say are important. So, you know, Kirk and I were talking earlier about Arizona State. I've, I've known, I knew Michael Crow when he was the chief research officer at Columbia. He's the president of Arizona State now. Arizona State builds itself to the new American University. I, I like Arizona State. I have no idea what the hell that means. 
All right, I, I don't know, but if you go on campus at Arizona State, everybody has drank the New American University Kool-Aid. And if you talk to companies, they talk about the New American University. All right, now, I, I'm, I'm a little being a little facetious. What does it mean? It means that they're forward facing and they're forward looking and they're risk takers. So the Starbucks deal, right? You all remember that was that seven, eight years ago? Every Starbucks employee could take Arizona State online, okay? At a lot of universities, that would be a eight or 10 month process to figure out how do we do this. Now, I don't know, I don't have any inside information, but knowing Michael a little bit and knowing uh, Ponch when he was there as the VPR, they said, hey, we should do this. And then they told the people that were operational, say, make it happen, make it happen. So I, I would say that's, Kirk. I mean, I think control what you can control, control what, what happens inside the university and then the word would spread. So uh, I made a comment earlier to you about uh, Minnesota, the University of Minnesota did not have a lot of success on a tech transfer front for years. They were seen as being very uh, challenging to work with. Tim Mulcahy became the chief research officer there. He was a biologist. He, I don't think he ever patented anything in his life. Tim looked at the numbers and he said, you know what, we're not good at this. We're gonna change what we're doing. And he over, overhaul the entire tech transfer office process there, and they created something called Minnesota IP. Minnesota IP has been publicized, right? People know about it. Cisco entered into a strategic partnership with the University of Minnesota in the last few months. That came because Cisco was attending a UIDP meeting, shameless plug for UIDP, uh, attended a UIDP meeting, and they heard someone talk about Minnesota IP. They heard Lisa Beesman talk about it. And they said, well, that's interesting. You know, we really struggle with intellectual property at other schools. Why don't we go talk to Minnesota? That's a pretty good school. Lo and behold, they have a, they have a new strategic collaboration. And so I think if you could position yourself internally, so, you know, you, you get the decks on the, on, the, on the ship right, then people will take notice. Okay, I'm, you're probably going to give me the hook. A little bit, but I think we have time for one more question. If there is okay. Anybody? Yes, sir. Sure. What are your thoughts around that? You know, and how does uh, an entity in a private company invest in a university and who at the end of the day gets to capitalize on the royalty? Yeah. It's a multi point question. Yeah, no, no. It, and, you know, it, it's a good question. Uh, you know, it's funny, our organization, we do not have an IP focus, but IP is embedded in everything that we talk about, right? Um, so uh, let's. Let's go to the nuances on this a little bit, okay? Companies are not monolithic. So if you're dealing with a large multinational company, like a pharmaceutical company, they understand how academic research goes. They understand by dole. They have an understanding of patent rights and faculty rights in the US. Um, they're gonna have a, a little different approach than a tier two supplier who's based in Albany, who's never worked with the university, but they've learned about a solution that you have, and they say, okay, well, we'll fund the research, but whatever you create, we own. And they don't really, they just don't get it. I mean, because once again, they don't, they're not an R&D company. They're a, you know, they're a producer, they make a widget, and you've created something that makes their widget better. Um, that takes work to, candidly, to, to work with them on, and I hate to use the term educating, but just communicating with them. What I find has worked in, that, in, those, in those experiences is if they're a, a tier two supplier for an automotive company, put them in touch with Ed Krauss from Ford, who actually understands this stuff. And Ed will say, you know what, what the University of Vermont is asking for is, that's pretty reasonable. That's what kind of the standard practice is. Um, because the person who's negotiating with you from the company, who's a tier two supplier, they don't know anything about R&D. They don't know about IP rights. They're, they're just an attorney, right? Or they're a product manager. 
So, you know, it, it, you can't say, well, companies, because companies are not the same. I mean, they, they vary by discipline. So, you know, you look at pharmaceutical companies, they want you to patent everything and they want to license it. Then you look at a company like VMware, right, that's in the cloud space. Their sponsored research agreements with the universities require you to use a public dedication of IP approach where you agree not to patent it and protect it so someone has to license it, right? Those are, those are two totally different perspectives because for VMware, if they have a, a cloud solution and there's a thousand ideas in that, how do you determine the value of the idea from the University of Vermont? So they say, you know what, we'll fund your research, but we want anybody to have access to that foundational research and then we'll apply it into our product. Pfizer's not gonna do that, I mean, right? bristol Myers Squibb's not gonna do that. They're gonna be like, no, 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 no. We, we wanna use patent for that, for that activity. So I think you have to be a little bit more discerning about when you talk about companies, big, small, field, you know, sectors and all that. Okay, anything else? All right, thank you so much for having me today.